So this evening, our presentation is hopefully um, going to leave you knowing about the signs and the symptoms of depression, the journey out of depression. Um, we're going to have a discussion around self-harm and suicidality, um, as well as how you can help a loved one with depression or suicidal ideation. And then there's going to be the interactive panel discussion. So we're just going to start off with some facts um, around depression. So we do know from the research that untreated depression is the number one cause of suicide. And depression can affect all ages, all races, and all economic group. Um, women suffer from depression twice as much as men do. One of the depression is one of the leading causes of disability, and at least half of the people suffering from depression do not get the proper treatment. So that's pretty significant. Half of the people who have depression do not get proper treatment. So um, on a positive note, we do know that once depression is recognized, over 80% of people who seek treatment feel better and get back to their regular lives, normal level of function. So a big question I always get working in a clinical setting is how, how is depression different from sadness? So depression can be more severe and it will often last longer. It's more than feeling down or blue after a negative event. Um, and we know that depression actually does cause chemical changes in the brain that can last for a few weeks, ongoing for months. Um, depression causes significant difficulties in people's level of functioning, including at school, at home, and just carrying out normal duties of life. Um, depression can be hard to treat. Someone with depression can seem normal to other people around them, but they can still experience symptoms. Um, depression doesn't have to have a reason or trigger. It can really happen at any time to anybody. So what influences depression? Again, we know from the research that there are changes in the brain. Um, with individuals who have a, a depressive disorder. Um, chronic physical illness like diabetes, heart disease, that can also lead uh, to depression. If there's a family history of depression or mental illness, that puts somebody in the family at a greater risk. Um, individuals who may experience racism, discrimination, or oppression. And as well, if there's a history of trauma or abuse, even in younger years, later on, that can result in, in a depressive disorder. Um, also, trauma that could be going on right now or significant life events that are difficult for people. Um, and stressors, added stressors, can lead to depression. Um, losing or feeling disconnected from your culture, your language, spiritual beliefs, traditions, ways of living or other parts of who you are. Getting disconnected from that um, can lead to depression. Um, also, the health of the community is a big one, um, such as job opportunities, access to services and resources, support networks, living conditions, and quality of life. We know people who don't have a healthy community are more at risk of um, struggling with depression as well as um, problems with alcohol or other substances. So symptoms of depression, what do we look for when we're making a diagnosis of depression? Um, oftentimes people will experience feeling down, sad, and really just feeling a sense of hopelessness most of the time. Um, they may feel like a failure, have a lot of guilty thoughts and really blaming themselves for things that they can't control. Kind of thinking everything is their fault. Um, we'll often see people are irritable, um, angry, just edgy. You don't know how to really approach them. It's like walking on eggshells at times and they just get uh, angry and irritable um, over even minor problems. Um, they often will um, say that they always just feel tired, no energy, don't even really feel like they want to get out of bed in the morning, lack of motivation, 
uh, a loss of interest in things that they would really quickly <coughs> enjoy. So maybe some social isolation, withdrawing from activities that they once found enjoyable. Um, also difficulty with concentrating focus and really making decisions and planning a routine or structure is very difficult um, when people are experiencing depressive symptoms and they'll even can feel like they have difficulty remembering things. Um, you'll also note that there's changes in the sleep pattern. So some people will sleep more than usual and others may say, I can't sleep at all. So, but it's a different sleep pattern from, from their normal sleep. Also, as well as changes in eating patterns, either loss of appetite or overeating. Um, and then physical complaints. They can have physical complaints that really have no other medical explanation. So a lot, a one I hear often is the sore stomach, always feeling like their stomach sore or a headache and there's just no other explanation for the cause of a headache or um, stomach problems. Um, and then having thoughts of wanting to end their life or hurting themselves in some, some way. So depression in youth, um, there's just a little bit of a, an audio video here. Things just seem off or wrong. You're crying a lot, either at nothing or something that normally would be insignificant. You feel like you're moving and thinking in slow motion. Your friends and family really irritate you. Your senses seem dulled. Food tastes bland and unin uninteresting. Music doesn't seem to affect you. You don't bother smelling flowers anymore. You're forgetful, and it's very difficult to concentrate on anything. You're anxious and worried a lot. Everything seems hopeless. You feel like you can't do anything right. You have recurring thoughts of death and or suicidal impulses. Smiling feels stiff and awkward. It, it's like your smiling muscles are frozen. You feel as though you're drowning or suffocating. So that was from somebody's own experience of depression, what they would say their symptoms are and what they're experiencing. It's so pretty significant when you hear it from somebody who, who's experiencing the depression. Um, now we're gonna hear about symptoms of depression in youth and how their parents see it. They ignore friends or they avoid their friends. They decrease in hygiene and grooming. They feel like they can't handle previous workload or responsibility. They're drinking or using drugs. There's increase in headaches, stomach aches, fatigue, but the doctor can't find anything wrong. They seem always angry and irritable. Their sleep pattern is messed up. There's no interest in physical affection and there's no plans and no hopes. That's often how parents see it. And oftentimes when it is a youth, um, it's parents or, or teachers or sports coaches who, who notice um, changes in the youth. So there's different types of depression. Um, the most common is, is a major depressive disorder. So that's when people are experiencing some of the symptoms I've talked about in the earlier or slide that last for at least two weeks. So it's not just one day, it goes on for at least two weeks. And it causes significant impairment in their daily functioning. Okay, and it can't be explained by any other um, medical condition. Another type of depression is a bipolar disorder where you see periods where people get significantly depressed and then they can also get the opposite side of the spectrum where they get overly what we would call manic where they're um, overly almost happy. Um, people can get a depression after having a child, postpartum depression, as well as uh, individuals can experience depression if they have a seasonal affective disorder. So that's seen you know, a lot of times in the winter months as the days get shorter, not as much sunlight, people can get um, a depression as the seasons change. So what depression is not? So it's not a character flaw or a sign of someone having a weak personality. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's not a mood that someone can just snap out of because you want them to. Um, it's not somebody just being too sensitive. It's not a sign of laziness or immaturity. It's not deserved or earned. 
And it's not an excuse. So don't use it as an excuse. So during a depression, you may experience emotional changes, and that's the irritability, sadness, anger. Um, you can also see behavioral changes. So that's when you may see people not enjoying what they used to like, withdrawing from their friends. Maybe they, they're using substances that they never used before, an increase in substances. So just noticing a change in their behavior. Um, you'll notice that their thoughts change. They may be saying things that they typically wouldn't say, or maybe you're noticing they're having more difficulty concentrating or focusing. Their memory's not what it is. They don't really know how to plan their day and execute a plan or a routine. But you just see changes in maybe how they're speaking to you or their thoughts may not be as organized. And sometimes you'll notice physical changes. So if they're overeating, undereating, there may be some weight changes. They may appear tired, lethargic, just like they're just the life is sucked out of them. <laughs> you may notice those physical changes. And we often see depression as a as a cycle. So there's a cycle of depression. So oftentimes people experience depression and they have low energy, fatigue, decreased interest, low motivation, which then brings them to decreased activity and they may begin to neglect some of the responsibilities. Maybe they're not showering, taking care of themselves. Maybe they're not cooking proper meals, which then brings forth increased guilt, hopelessness, and they just feel like I'm ineffective. I'm worthless. I'm not doing anything, which then makes the depression worse. So any point in this cycle can kind of lead to the other. So there's a cycle to it. So now I'm just going to touch on... Uh, self-harm. So what is self-harm? So it's when someone hurts themselves on purpose, but does not have the intention to end their life. It's also known as self-injurious um, behavior or non-suicidal self-injury. So oftentimes people will cut, they may burn their skin, hit themselves, um, they may have a wound and, and pick at it so it doesn't heal, bite themselves, maybe bang their head into the wall. Um, so it is a sign that someone needs support and may have a mental health concern. So why do people self-injure? It's for different reasons. Many different reasons people self-injure. Um, it could be to cope with their depression and anxiety, uh, cope with loss or trauma or violence that they may have experienced in the past or other difficult situations. Some people do it as a means to punish themselves. They, they just think they're worth nothing, so they just want to punish themselves. And lots of times I hear, especially with youth, it's to turn emotional pain into more of a physical sensation. So it kind of distracts them from their emotional pain because now it becomes a physical pain. Um, and it feels real. Lots of people who are experiencing depression just maybe feel numb. So it kind of brings them back to having a feeling. Um, and to regain control of their own body. So who self-injures? Um, it can affect anyone. Um, the population that are most likely to engage in self-harm is adolescents, especially females. People who have experienced stressful or traumatic events. People who have a difficult time coping with their feelings, so they just get so frustrated and don't know what else to do. They just, they hurt themselves. Um, people who have low self-esteem. And there's a significant... Um, self-harm in our First Nations youth. So what are some warning signs that somebody may be self-harming? They often appear withdrawn, maybe more quiet or reserved than usual. So again, that's a bit of a behavior change. Um, stop participating in regular activities that they used to participate in. Maybe the fear they don't want anyone to know this. Um, they may have rapid mood changes. So you may see the irritability. One minute they may be joking and happy. The next minute they may be yelling at you, crying. So just various mood changes. Easily to get upset or angry. Um, 
and maybe a significant event that occurred in their lives, a breakup, um, parents separating, um, just fight with a friend, fight with parents. Um, oftentimes you'll see a decline in their academic performance when normally they may do very, very well, or you may see a decline in their same uh, work um, performance as well. And then they might have unexplained scratches, bruises, perhaps you may notice these things and um, it's, it's unexplained or they'll try to avoid the question if you ask them what that's from. And sometimes you may see them wear inappropriate clothes. So it may be a hot day and they might have long sleeves on just to try to cover up if they're doing any cutting on their forearms. Um, and then lots of times they may reference um, their self-injury in their writing, maybe at school in the art projects they hand in in their journals, they may make reference to it. Um, almost becomes a little bit of a fixation. Well, that's um, the self-harm. So now we're going to talk about suicidal ideation and suicidality. So what is it? So suicidal ideation is thinking about dying or suicide. So we have passive suicidality, which is when somebody may think about suicide, but doesn't have a plan or intent. So it's quite common. Many people at some point in their lives might just have a thought about, I wonder what life would be here if I wasn't here, or have a thought, maybe I'd just rather die in a very heightened emotional state. Um, and most people who have suicide thoughts don't carry them out. Um, People are at risk if they have a family history of mental illness, they're more likely to have suicidal thoughts. So some causes of suicidal ideation can include anxiety, as we said earlier, depression is the leading cause, uh, eating disorders, substance abuse, so what are some of the signs and symptoms? When you notice that someone is feeling trapped or hopeless, they just feel there's no hope, they feel life's not worth continuing and they just feel trapped inside of their body. Um, feeling intolerable, emotional pain, they just feel like they're in so much emotional pain they just don't even wanna, they can't imagine getting out of it. Um, being unable to experience pleasure. So no matter what kind of fun, they might be with their friends, they might be with their family, there's just no pleasure. It's just kind of going through the motions. There may be an abnormal preoccupation with dying, death, and violence. Um, again, you see the mood swings going from happy to sad. Uh, and they may talk about guilt, how they feel guilty about something or a lot of shame. Maybe they want revenge. Um, having severe remote remorse or self-criticism, just talking negatively about themselves. Um, increased isolation is a big one. Staying in their room or in their house, not wanting to go out. Um, you might notice what we call psychomotor agitation. So just not being able to be still, just fidgeting, moving, just looking really agitated, almost like you're in pain and you just don't even know what to do. Like you want to run a marathon, but you can't move. But you just see that psychomotor agitation. Um, and then you might see them easily agitated or um, having periods of really heightened anxiety, where it's just hard, hard to bring them down. Those are some of the, the signs and symptoms. Um, some others are changes in personality. You'll just notice something's different. They're not the same. Um, routine or sleeping patterns change, maybe not getting out of bed, not sleeping at all. They're just thinking, um, talking about just being a burden to others, feeling not wanted. Um, could be consuming drugs or alcohol more so than normal, or maybe it's a new behavior. Uh, you may see engaging in risky behavior, so taking risks that they normally wouldn't take, maybe driving a car super fast or um, something that would be out of character, that would be considered risky. Um, 
Then you might notice they're just starting to get things in order, maybe giving some of the items that are special to them away to other people. Um, they may even say goodbye to other people, maybe write some notes um, to say goodbye. And then you might notice they start obtaining things that they can use to maybe end their life. Maybe they talk about suicide or dying. So some of the risk factors for suicidality include a family history of mental health issues, a family history of violence, feelings of hopelessness, being LGBTQIA2+, with little or no family support, um, using substances or having substance abuse problems, having mental health concerns already, maybe impulsive, sleep deprivation, family history of suicide, a family history of substance abuse, feelings of seclusion or loneliness, legal trouble, um, maybe some disciplinary at school or work, um, maybe previous attempts or self-harm, um, owning their gun or having a lethal weapon or ways to end their life, and knowing someone who has died by suicide. So just a chart here to kind of differentiate um, self-harm and suicide. So just in terms of the frequency, uh, individuals who, who self-harm, it's quite frequent. They do it quite frequently, you know, superficial cuts or some burns or hit themselves. It happens often, whereas suicide attempts will happen less frequently. Um, methods for self-harm, cutting, burning, self-hitting, suicide, you often things like self-poisoning, hanging, things like that. Um, self-harm is less severe, whereas suicide attempts can be much more severe and sometimes they're lethal. Um, and the purpose differs in that in self-harm um, is often done to avoid suicidal impulses, whereas Suicide or attempts are done with the intent that the person no longer wants to live. So self-harm is not suicide, um, but it may become suicide. And that's why we also take self-harm seriously because um, it could lead to an unintentional suicide. There's a low intent, the person doesn't want to die, but sometimes if it gets carried away or they do something that they don't want to do, you know, cut at the wrong place, who knows? It, it could lead to an unintentional um, suicide. And whereas suicide is, is typically a high intent, the person has made up their mind, I don't want to live. And, and that's kind of the outcome they're going for. And, you know, um, sometimes it just, that can be an injury if it's not done how it was intended, or if someone maybe intervenes. Give it to you, Suzanne. Thanks, Joey. So I'm gonna be talking about suicide in Indigenous communities, and then moving forward, talking about treatment options for depression, with a particular focus on not only treating the individual who is depressed, but also some considerations for family members and preventing caregiver burnout. I don't know if you can see behind me with these statistics, but the statistics are staggering. Suicide and self-inflicted injuries are the leading cause of death in First Nations youth and adults. And suicide rates for First Nation males are a lot higher compared to males who are not First Nation. Um, and you can also see on the next slide that these statistics are also similar for females. So the rates of suicide and also for self-harm are um, immensely greater for um, Indigenous females as opposed to females who are not Indigenous. And also Inuit youth have the highest rates of suicide at 11 times the national average. I was very surprised finding this statistic and I'm not sure if you guys are also equally as shocked. Um, so ultimately when we're talking about treatment strategies for addressing depression, we definitely need to take this population into consideration. Here are some basic do's and don'ts of responding to suspected self-harm and suicidality. 
Don't be afraid to ask and to be direct. Don't be overly reactive. So uh, as much as possible, try your best to stay calm. Don't try to stop the behavior with threats or ultimatums because that's not going to be effective. Don't promise the person you won't tell anyone. Oftentimes you want to tell as many people as possible so that individual gets as many um, supports that they need. And don't feel solely responsible to fix the person if they disclose self-harm or suicidality. And we'll be talking on the next slide about things that you can do, whether or not you are a health professional. So with these strategies here, these are strategies that can be helpful to anyone, no matter who they are, what their education training. Ultimately, we can listen and validate. We can take the time to really hear what the other person is saying and to validate their concerns as much as possible. Ultimately, we want to let them know that there is hope, that there are lots of supports out there to help. We want to communicate in a calm and caring way. We want to use non-judgmental language. So having a very open kind of body language, asking a lot of open-ended questions. And then we want to encourage the use of coping strategies that have worked in the past, particularly if the person is in distress, we can't problem solve the best so we can work with that individual to problem solve and remind them, okay, if this has happened before, what kind of things were successful that have helped you in the past? Also, is there anything in the environment that you can potentially take away, take away any temptations or anything that could potentially be risky for the individual? Depending on the severity of the situation, you can follow up or encourage the individual to follow up with a mental health professional. In more immediate cases, they might need medical attention, especially if there is, um, for example, um, with self-harm, something that needs to be addressed medically. You might need to call crisis response. You might have to bring them to the hospital or encourage them to go to the hospital or to call 911. Ultimately, ongoing monitoring is important. So the monitoring is not only reflective of self-monitoring and monitoring from the family and loved ones, but then also more formally uh, monitoring from a healthcare provider, such as physician, psychiatrist, social work, psychologist. Now I'm going to be talking about just doing a very basic risk assessment, and this is something that we all can learn, again, regardless of our background, training, or experience. And I think it's really important, particularly in emergency situations, where immediate medical attention might not be unavailable, and ultimately this can help to save lives. As an example, with this type of risk assessment, in a very general sense, there are three different categories that you can place an individual with low, medium, high risk for suicidality. With low risk, there might be some risk factors present, so getting that information from the person. For example, they might have a sense of hopelessness, or they might have depression, feeling really low or pessimistic about the future. However, with low risk, they are not actively suicidal, there's no plan development, and there's no intent. So they might have fleeting, passive suicidal thoughts. They have ultimately some reasons for living and they also have protective factors. So these are very positive factors, things that they have going for them. Um, and that's a conversation you can have with the individual or you can help them to remind, remind them about the different protective factors. Just as an example, they might have good physical health. They might have really good social supports and lots of friends. Um, they might have a really strong cultural connection or a connection to a community. So all of these are examples of protective factors that help to mitigate their risk. With medium risk, they might have current suicidal thoughts, but they might not have immediate, immediate intent. There are some reasons for living and some protective factors, but ultimately it's a little bit more of a risk as opposed to the, the low risk type of assessment. And then with high risk, ultimately, these are going to be individuals who have active suicidal thoughts. They often have a plan. They often have taken steps. So, for example, gotten materials to follow through with that plan. They might have limited reasons for living. And they might not be able to identify very many protective factors. So what to do? Globally, across all the different risk levels, ongoing monitoring is going to be important. 
regular sessions with someone they feel connected with. So it could be a psychotherapist or a counselor. It could be an elder. It could be you know, a social worker, psychotherapist. Psychiatric consultation might also be a benefit, especially if the individual has gone to therapy before and they found it hasn't really been beneficial. They might want to talk to um, a psychiatrist or a family physician about the benefits of medication. Um, and ultimately, the research shows that a combination of the two, so both medication and therapy, produces um, really great outcomes uh, in terms of treating depression and suicidality. For individuals who are low to medium risk, these are some additional strategies. Ultimately, we want to discuss ways to keep them safe, and you can develop a safety plan that we're going to talk about in a couple of slides. We might need to contact a parent guardian or other trusted adult if applicable. This is also particularly for youth. We want to encourage the use of positive coping strategies if possible. Even if it's something very small, whatever they can manage is better than nothing. So typically we would want to encourage exercise, pleasurable activities, self-care, personal hygiene, and any sort of task that provides the individual with a sense of accomplishment or mastery. We also want to encourage them to start therapy or to increase the frequency of their sessions if required. For an individual who is deemed to be more of a high risk, we want to take more of a direct approach, more of an assertive approach and get them support immediately. We want to contact a parent, guardian or other trusted adult if applicable. Um, more for youth, but also if it's an adult, for example, we can call um, a friend or a family member for the individual. We would want them to develop a safety plan. We would also want to review different types of protective factors, encourage ongoing communication, encourage the use of distress tolerant skills. So for example, distraction techniques and deep breathing just to get by moment by moment. And then we would want to implement any other strategies necessary. So just depending on the circumstances, we might need to bring them to the nursing station or the hospital or encourage them to call crisis response, for example. I think prevention is key. So we're not only going to be talking about strategies that are more reactive, I think in terms of prevention long-term is going to be really important, especially for youth. So when people are younger, having those really positive role models and teaching kids all about emotions, how to deal with really big emotions in appropriate ways, modeling positive coping strategies, and also encouraging open and honest communication in the home, building trust with that individual, whether it be a family member or a friend or working with someone in a different capacity in the community, that trust is gonna take time to build. And the more trust there is, the more likely that an individual who might be struggling with some of these issues would feel um, comfortable in approaching you and talking about it with you. Before treatment, I usually like to encourage my clients about self-reflection and thinking about these specific things before starting anything. Number one would be motivation. How motivated are you to seek help, to make some positive life changes? You can even rate it on a scale and track that motivation over time. I also want to, them to think about the commitment. So am I committed to achieving these goals that I've set out for myself or these ideas that I have? about addressing my depression? And are there any barriers to potentially prevent me from achieving that goal? How do I address those barriers? And lastly, support. So who's in my corner? How can I use those supports? And if I don't have any supports, where can I find them in my community? Now in terms of treatment for suicidality, self-harm and depression, going back to the basics, self-care, can be seen as basic by some individuals, but it's really key, very important. And self-care means different things to different people. It's very much an umbrella term, and these are just some examples, definitely not an exhaustive list. For example, self-care can mean going outside, getting some fresh air, taking a walk in nature, fueling your body, so eating proper foods, getting proper sleep, showering once in a while, reaching out to someone that you care about, and also acknowledging your feelings, practicing self-compassion, for example. Here are some basic lifestyle changes 
that can help to stabilize mood. And oftentimes people feel uh, more comfortable starting these types of changes first, as opposed to jumping to therapy right away. So these are some things that you can do before starting therapy and also in between sessions, more on a maintenance basis. So for example, exercise and physical activity is very important. And in some individuals, it can be just as effective as medication and treating depression. You also want to ensure that you're eating a balanced and healthy diet, that you're practicing good sleep hygiene as much as possible, and then cutting back or quitting with respect to alcohol, cigarettes, and illicit substances. There are various evidence-based strategies to help with depression and suicidality, and these are just a few. One is spiritual, traditional, or even community support. And this can look very different just depending on the individual. But for example, you can speak with an elder, you can attend a sweat lodge, you can engage in smudging. The therapeutic approach that I am trained in is CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. We're going to be talking about that in the next few slides. And that's a very important approach for addressing depression and also DBT. Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, which is a type of CBT that's a little bit more focused, and we'll also talk a little bit more about that. There's medication, so for example, antidepressants, and then there are many, many peer and community support groups in person, but also online and through social media. Now with CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, it looks at how our thoughts and feelings are influenced from events and how it affects our behaviors. It also gets us to reflect and change behaviors and beliefs over time. So part of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy is education, teaching individuals that our thoughts, our bodily sensations, our emotions, and our behaviors are all connected. And we can't change our emotions or our bodily sensations but we can change our thoughts and we can change our behaviors. So in therapy, we focus on how to modify our behaviors and thoughts to help alleviate the depression. CBT also teaches individuals coping skills that are more positive and less self-destructive. And CBT helps in challenging automatic negative thoughts that we sometimes accept are true and that is associated with uh, depression. So in therapy, we get them to recognize those automatic negative thoughts in the moment, and then we help to teach them to evaluate those thoughts and be really critical, like researchers. So trying to figure out, is there actually evidence to support that thought, yes or no? And CBT works well with various populations and various age groups. We saw the cycle of depression earlier, and essentially with therapy and different forms of intervention, we are going to do the opposite and reverse the depression cycle. For example, if we get individuals to exercise a little bit more, take care of themselves, increase self-care and community support, oftentimes individuals are slowly going to feel more hopeful, more confident, feel less guilty. You're gonna notice that your depression symptoms are gonna to start to get better over time. As a result, you're gonna have more energy and more motivation to then carry out more self-care, more behavioral activation, and then the cycle continues. So improving depression ultimately is just a series of baby steps over time that has cumulative effects. This is an example of a typical uh, therapy activity where we challenge negative thoughts. So we're going to first describe the situation write down all the negative automatic thoughts that come to mind, and then respond to each thought with a more balanced or neutral statement. So as an example, if an individual has an argument with their daughter, and then they get these automatic negative thoughts, like, oh, I'm such a bad parent, no one, ever, no one ever pays attention to me, or no one loves me, then we recognize what those thoughts are, and then we come up with alternative thoughts. As an example here, well, they do pay attention, but not as often as I'd like, or I'm not a ter terrible parent, but teenagers can be difficult to deal with. So ultimately, the more that you practice this type of activity, both in session and outside of session, the more automatic it can become. So this is a really great cognitive strategy to help with the depression. Now, DBT is also uh, an evidence-based approach. It could be effective with youth, with adults, 
Um, and essentially breaks it down into four different types of skills. So there's mindfulness, distress tolerance, emotion regulation, and interpersonal effectiveness. And in my opinion, the first three are the most important, particularly in crisis situations when dealing with suicidality. As an example, with the distress tolerance type of skills, in a crisis situation, these are some basic strategies that are very effective. For example, using the acronym of TIPP, T-I-P-P, temperature. So changing your bodily temperature can help. This could be, for example, taking off a sweater. It could be, you know, holding an ice cube, something that can um, change your temperature. It can also go the other way. So, you know, stepping into a sauna, feeling that warmth. Intense exercise, something to get you sweating or get the blood pumping. Paced breathing, just as an example, breathing in to the count of five, holding your breath, and then breathing out to the count of seven and doing that for a few minutes. And paired muscle relaxation. So this is when you tense your muscles when breathing in and then relax them when breathing out. So these are some great skills to remember, not only when you're depressed, but also when you're in a crisis situation because you can pretty much do them anywhere. Anywhere, anytime, and you don't necessarily need someone else to help you. You can implement these on your own. So those are some basic skills to teach individuals, particularly if they are dealing with self-harm and suicidality. And then as mentioned before, with safety planning, this is just a typical example of a safety plan. Usually you would work with a psychologist or another mental health professional in a therapy setting to come up with the plan. Then the therapist would keep a copy, the client would go home with a copy, but you can certainly develop something like this at home as well. And this is just an example that the language can change, but essentially there's a component of reminding the individual what their supports are. And if you want, you can also list them with their name and their phone number. And then the other part of the safety plan would be encouraging them to engage in coping strategies. And again, when someone is stressed or in a crisis, their problem solving skills aren't the greatest. So by having all of this very clearly laid out for them, it could really be beneficial. As an example, if I'm starting to feel like I'm wanting to hurt myself, I might want to call the doctor, call crisis response, remember that my life is valuable, or you can use a different type of positive coping statement, whatever is going to work for you. I'm going to remember to take my medication. I'm going to remember to get in contact with people that support me. I'm going to remove all temptations, including alcohol and substances. I'm going to potentially remove things from my environment that might be tempting for me so I don't hurt myself. I'm going to be aware of my moods and know my warning signs. And I'm going to be kind to myself and practice self-compassion. And with this type of safety plan, it's not written in stone. It could be an ever-changing document. So you can modify as needed, just depending on the level of suicidality or depending on any other needs that might come up during the time. So lastly, I wanted to talk about the effects of depression on caregivers, loved ones. We have parents, caregivers, friends, et cetera. This could also be teachers, peers, other community members. Ultimately, there's a lot of focus on the diagnosis and treatment of the individual who is depressed, but there's not as much out there focusing on caregiver support and also caregiver burnout. Ultimately, these are the five stages of depression fallout for caregivers. Number one is confusion. Why is someone I love behaving this way? So you might be looking for reasons and answers. Oftentimes, individuals will say, you know what, maybe it's my fault. Maybe I did something in terms of my parenting. Maybe I said something to, to cause them to be depressed. Usually that's not the case, but there could be a lot of negative thoughts towards yourself at this stage. Going into self, uh, stage number two is self-doubt. What, what have I done wrong? So you would focus on all the mistakes that you've made in your life and minimize the actual individual. And that's not, ne not necessarily fair. So that individual maybe wasn't taking care of themselves. Maybe they were ignoring um, supports. Maybe they weren't making healthy choices or engaging in risky behaviors. Stage three, demoralization. 
to ultimately over time, if you feel like you know, you're really stuck, you can't help this individual that you really care about, you might feel your self-esteem might be lost or that your morale may decrease. And then oftentimes with that sense of helplessness and lack of control that we feel that perceived lack of control, it could potentially turn into stage four, which would be anger. Stage four is very closely tied into stage three. And during this stage, you could push people away or you can push people to engage in unhealthy ways of coping with those emotions. And lastly, with stage five, the desire to escape. So there's an ongoing tension between that desire to, to help the individual and try your best to continue to support them, but at the same time, feeling that conflicting feeling that, you know what, I might want to abandon that individual, I might need to take a step back, or I might need to create some space. So those are the five stages of fallout of de depression. And ultimately to help with that, these are some basic strategies to help increase one's sense of control and help caregivers and loved ones cope. Because ultimately we can't change other people. We can only focus on ourselves and what we can change ourselves. Ultimately, number one would be to educate yourself about depression, suicidality as much as possible, going online, attending workshops like this. Compassionately confront your loved one, again, really being direct and having that open and honest communication about their depression or suicidality. Also giving them some treatment options. Talking to your loved one's healthcare providers about their mood issues and also joining a support group or maybe you might need to participate in a few sessions of psychotherapy on your own so you can learn coping skills for dealing with the emotions that you might be experiencing and learning to set boundaries. So ultimately to prevent that burnout, we have to put that oxygen mask on first before assisting anyone else with that oxygen mask. So we have to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves first and then we can adequately help that loved one with depression. Okay. So that's the end of our presentation. Judy mentioned that we're not gonna be taking a break. We're just gonna go right through with the panel. Perfect. Okay, so who's going to be joining us on the panel? Sure. I'll let you take the floor, Judy. <laughs> so that was our presentation. Um, I believe when we advertised the workshop, we had indicated that there might be police representation to sit on the panel. We weren't able to work that out for this evening. Um, so we do have. Haley Surat, she's from the Crisis Program. She is on the panel, and um, obviously Joy and Suzanne and myself um, as an educator and trainer for the ASSIST program, which is applied suicide intervention uh, skills training. So um, I know Tiffany's been writing a few questions that have come from the virtual um, attendees, and I, we've also given you some slips of paper if you have questions that you would like to ask of the panel um, and we'll just take them as they come. Does anybody here have a question that they would like to start with? No? I'll just pack these up to you. And okay. If anyone sure. more coming on with sure. Haley, if you speak to one, can you just come up to the mic? Okay. Okay, so the first question is, could you please explain what, service, what services are available for crisis response? <laughs> so the crisis response program is a 24 seven service. Uh, we have a phone line that's available uh, Monday to Sunday, seven days a week, uh, Christmas, New Year's, you name it, and there's somebody on the line. So what that looks like is if somebody calls into our line, they're then given access immediately to a mental health professional who can help with de-escalating, with safety planning, like Suzanne talked about, with assessing risk. If somebody's having thoughts about harming themselves, either with self-harm or maybe some suicidal thoughts. But it also is a mental health professional that can listen, if you need someone to listen to, that can talk and walk you through some of those coping skills that you may be looking for. We also have a JMCR program. 
So this is a team of two mental health professionals that respond to police calls that are deemed mental health related. So if the police were to go out on a call, they arrived and they realized, you know what, I think this person needs a little bit more support. They don't need to come with us or it's not a criminal matter. It actually is a, a mental health concern. They can call our team and our team goes out and meets with them. They provide support. They can help people with accessing the hospital. They can connect them with long-term um, resources. And they can also just spend time with the person and the individual to, and family to make sure that they're getting the support they need to determine what's best for their loved one at that time. We have a mobile unit as well, which actually works with JMCR, but it means that we can come out to people's homes without police as well. So if you or a loved one is experiencing a mental health crisis, we can actually have that team of two come out, meet with the family, meet with you, walk through your options, look at what supports you need, look at what long-term connections we can make in the community, and really just help in that moment to get you connected to where you need to live. We also have many, many programs. Um, so we have a safe bed as well. Because of COVID, that safe bed and stabilization program has kind of been put on hold. We are able to offer limited resources in that way. But come the new year, it is expanding to a five bed program, which will offer stabilization, mental health supports on a short-term basis, up to 30 days. Um, for people who are involved with the police system, involved with justice, or at the hospital, or needing a bit of that mental health support a bit longer term. That's where we're at right now. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, Haley. Um, the next question is, what can I do for someone who I'm extremely concerned about, but they refuse to seek help or take medication, but are constantly talking about not wanting to be here? Generally, what we find is people who are struggling tend to um, put out invitations or feelers to people around them who, whom they trust, and it's up to us to recognize those signs. So if, if somebody's looking for some support, it might come out in different ways, um, as we had identified in the workshop. So really, our role is just about exploring those invitations a little bit, inquiring, being curious, asking some questions, and um, identifying the risk level. We talked about the risk levels tonight and trying to determine with that person where they're at and if they are really truly thinking about suicide or are they just depressed. Those are two different things. We need to be very clear on if we're dealing with suicide or depression. And from there, um, being good helpers, we would also help them work through the process and getting them linked up, connected with other services. Now, some of the recommended um, trainings that we have done, um, there's one through Living Works. It's called Living Works Start. It's a one hour training, which is on their website. It's $20. And it really gives you some very basic skills in getting that conversation going with someone if this is totally new for you. Um, they're offering it um, during the pandemic virtually, which is a really nice option because a lot of the other trainings that I would really recommend um, can't be done right now. They have to be done face to face. So this program called Living Works Start is on the Living Works um, website and I believe it's $20. So, I don't know if anybody else has more to add to that conversation. Yeah, that was great, Judy. I just wanted to add, too, in terms of, um, you know, problem solving or reminders about medication, talking about the potential benefits of medication, sometimes it's better coming from an external source rather than a family member. So if they're hearing even the same information, but it's coming from a psychologist or physician or practitioner, it might be a little bit more meaningful. Thank you. So our crisis line is very good for situations like this where somebody might not be ready or willing to engage yet. People can remain anonymous. Sometimes that gives them that little bit of a disconnect that can get that first step towards talking to somebody about how they're feeling. 
So if you have somebody in your life who's really struggling to reach out, um, passing along our crisis number is a really good option to get them kind of that slow introduction where they don't necessarily have to commit to anything long term yet. There are some other options for youth in particular who don't tend to express themselves very well verbally. Um, there's text line uh, support services. Um, just offhand, I can't recall. Kids Help. Kids Help Phone has text. Kids Help Phone, but there are some resources that they can actually text in and get support. There's also the Bounce Back program through Canadian Mental Health Association Ontario, um, which is a free um, service that's, that provides um, a services for mild to moderate depression. And people can sign up for that and be coached through um, lessons. And I believe it's the DBT um, approach as well with that training. So there's lots of resources out there um, that you can tap into through the internet as well. Thank you. Um, another question. If I had a concern for somebody who was expressing suicidal thoughts, how could crisis help me or the individual? Thing for a <laughs> <laughs> um, so like I mentioned before, crisis is 24-7. So if you were to call our line, and I'll make sure that those numbers are shared on the Facebook page as well as you guys all have cards, uh, you would immediately have access to a mental health professional. So that would look like you pick up the phone and you're going to hear a very friendly voice that's able to say better day crisis response, and they can meet you at where you're at with this loved one, or if it's for yourself. Um, so from there, they'll look at doing a risk assessment, like Suzanne was talking about. Where does the risk fall? They'll be able to recommend, should you be attending hospital? Can we do some safety planning or some safety contracting to keep this individual at home and safe? Should we be connecting you to other resources and what would that look like? Um, another question is, who would a school contact um, with concerns? So I can speak to this for a moment. Most of the schools, if not all of them, um, have social workers or guidance counselors. But another addition that most of the schools have now is mental health nurses um, who sometimes they, the teachers will, or guidance counselor or social worker will identify students who may be struggling and then refer them to these mental health nurses who um, know ton about community resources and will often um, make appropriate referrals to get um, students the help that they may need. Does anyone know much about the Be Safe app that you can talk about? <laughs> it's just an added resource. It was okay. mentioned. Oh, okay. People. Yeah, I don't know much about the Be Safe app, but I'm going to look now. <laughs> Sorry. Here. Does anyone in the audience know anything about the Be Safe app? Or has anyone heard of it? Okay. I think generally, though, apps are a really good idea, especially with youth. Yeah. There's a lot out there, too, for depression. If you just Google, um, you know, 2020 best apps for depression in youth, for example, there are a lot of really great lists. Any other questions? So I could drag this one out. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Is there a support group for adults dealing with their adult children that have mental illness that are in denial of having mental illness? Like, mm -hmm. I think perhaps maybe I could address that a little bit. I know in the past, um, the trainer who was working before me was running a program for families. And um, that's kind of been put on hold once again because that's a face-to-face -face kind of group. Um, it is our hope to start that up again once the door is open. Yeah. So we talk about things like boundaries, um, coping, uh, the recovery model, you know, that kind of stuff. And 
and how to have those conversations and and support somebody as well as support ourselves yeah. right thank you for asking that and there's nothing available at the moment for like kind of peer-based support groups there's also the option of family therapy there's certain organizations both community-based and, and private organizations that would offer that if that's something um, there's also, and it's not for all mental illness, of course, but if anybody's um, struggling with substance use or addiction, there's the Al Anon groups, which you can find online, and they're doing virtual meetings and groups right now, which can be very helpful for families. It's a really great resource. They go over a lot of setting boundaries, kind of healthy relationships, that kind of thing. But if substance use is kind of involved in that, it might be a good resource. Um, I'm actually know what my question would be per se, but I did reach out like to our doctor and I reached out to this organization and I reached out and I knew my son was really struggling. We lost him to suicide last summer. And I really felt that there wasn't enough support in Thunder Bay. Like I was, I went to my doctor and I was sent away and I came here and I didn't get to us in time. And I feel like if someone was in the same position, and they saw all the warning signs, and they saw everything that was happening, and they were reaching out, and nothing happened in time, and now he's gone. I wonder how that could help somebody else going forward from here. And then now having like another family member, you can reach out all you want, but I don't actually know like if someone has come to me and say, what do I do? I'm like, I don't know. I tried everything and I lost it. So I'm not sure what your thoughts are. Like, are we lacking um, funding here in Cedar Bay? Like, do we need to go at a government level and try and get more staff in Thunder Bay? Um, what, what are we lacking in Thunder Bay that we're losing so many people? And I saw red flags all over the place. And I was like, my son needs help. He needs help right now. And I went and I, I'm seeking help desperately and I lost him. And the day that the OPP were looking for my son was the day that people were like, oh, we can meet with you today. And I said, you know what, it's too late. And I said, the OPP were looking for him, he's gone. And so going forward from here, what do we do? What do we do? I wish there was a straightforward, simple answer to that. I know there's a lot of long wait lists and not just for depression, suicidality, for a lot of mental health issues, just in general. If you go the private route, then, you know, oftentimes a wait list will be shorter, but then there's also a lot of limitations too. So there's not enough staff. I think kind of both. There's a lack of funding like at a government level, but then there's also some issues too here locally. Um, and also too, you can do so much and you can have so much more support, but ultimately we don't have control. Like that control is within that person. So even if there were other options, maybe it would have helped, maybe not. Yeah. I really feel for you. I'm sad to hear that story. Um, the person that's going through that is really in a deep place and, and there's a lot of pain and heaviness. And sometimes as a caregiver or somebody who's trying to help, the more we can learn, even as a suggestion and how to walk that walk through them. Because sometimes we want, we want the solution quick and sometimes we have to go through that darkness and do the walk with them and really listen to the pain and, and be part of that. And, and that's a really uncomfortable place to be, but sometimes that's where a person wants you to be with them, experiencing you know, the sadness and talking about it and you know, that kind of stuff. And, and the more we can learn to just kind of be okay with that, and you know, that's a, that might help a little bit too in terms of um, learning those skills of how to be patient and you know supportive so um never easy never easy but i thought the hospital also had the kind of better triaging now 
to do better and we can do better I just you know every day we have conversations of how can we do better what can we do better and you know we learn from situations but there's no there's no quick fix and I think it, it starts at every level from primary care to hospital care to community mental health services um, yeah I just first want to say thank you for sharing your story because that's why we're here, right? To change change the dialogue. Um, and there are, there's holes in the system. There are. Uh, crisis tries to plug those as much as we can. So I do encourage everybody to reach out if you're in this situation. If you're in the hospital parking lot and you're just not sure what the next step is, please reach out to crisis um, because somebody is always there to at least problem solve with you and meet you in that moment. And even if it's just to support you as you support somebody else, that's what we're there for. And I would say, sorry, Haley, even for some advocacy, yeah. you know, um, the crisis is very good at advocating to and saying this person needs attention, this yeah. person needs hospitalization, this person should not leave your door. Um, that, that kind of conversation Absolutely. can happen as well. We have a working relationship with the MHAT team, which is the mental health assessment team at the Thunder Bay Regional Hospital. And that means that we can directly talk to them. If somebody is presenting at the hospital, whether it's with police, whether it's with our team, whether it's with mom or grandma or dad or best friend or partner, if we're brought into the loop there, we can help advocate in that way. And I wish I could say that that's a miraculous <laughs> fix, but it's not. <laughs> there are rules there. And we're working, we're working our best as a team. That's why we're having panels like this. So I, I do really appreciate you bringing your story forward because that's not easy to do, but it does. It, it opens the conversation for us to talk about what can we put in place then. And if you have any suggestions or thoughts, send them our way because we're happy to hear from people who, you know, have utilized a system. Some aren't ideal circumstances, that's for sure, outcomes. And um, we're happy to hear your suggestions and, and make any changes we can. I just want to comment for a couple hats as someone who works at CMHA, but also someone who lost my brother to suicide. And um, I wish there was an easy answer to give people. Um, you know, we, we know statistics that 10 people every day in Canada die by suicide. And worldwide, somebody dies by suicide every 40 seconds. Those are such alarming numbers that, to me, those numbers tell us that there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done, not just in Thunder Bay, but you know, all over the world. And I, I wish there was an easy answer. I wish there was an easy way, you know, been down that road, bring someone to the hospital, and I know there's something not right with him, but you know, how do you get them that help? And it's frustrating as a family member for certain. Um, it's just tough, but I think that having conversations like this and bringing the awareness and being able to talk about it, I hope will see change. Um, and I thank you for sharing that. It's yeah, not easy, but um, I have hope that we can make a difference and that we can, we can get there. And I think by continuing to have these types of things that maybe one day we'll see the difference. And I do have hope. I think that's the message that we want to deliver here as well. There is hope. And even somebody who's struggling has hope because they're still here. So working with that and staying with them through the, the journey is really the best that we can do sometimes. And um, sometimes the person will kind of direct their own path the way it's going to go. And there's not much that we can do then. But did anybody else have any other Questions? Well, 
Well, I guess we can kind of wrap it then. Um, I hope that you gained a few things to put into your toolbox and, and use. Um, and I hope that you got something out of the workshop. Um, I do have evaluation forms if somebody would like to provide any feedback on tonight in terms of what you liked or what you got out of the workshop. In terms of the people who are watching virtually, we will probably send something out to you via your email and hopefully you will give us some feedback on the presentation as well. But I want to thank everybody who came and, and attended the workshop and um, just keep in mind all the, the services that are here to help you if you do need to reach out for more information. So thank you for coming and have a safe night. Thank you.